Good afternoon, everybody. It is noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern on a Monday, which means it's time for content chat. And I'm your host, Erica Heald. And today my guest is Diane Burley, whose name you might recognize because she is one of the co-conspirators and co-authors in the Content Entrepreneur uh, book that I participated in. Diane, welcome to Content Chat. Hey, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you. Well, we appreciate it. And I'm really psyched for us to talk about conducting proprietary research because as a former journalist, as I know you are too, the ability to conduct that research and then create content from it is always one of my most favorite things to do as a project. But before we dive into that, I'd love it if you could take a few minutes to tell folks a little bit about who you are and what you do. Well, um, you, you mentioned the part where I'm a former journalist and the, those habits die hard, very hard. <laughs> uh, but I crossed over from uh, writing and reporting about electronic media in 1995 to actually managing uh, the transformation of a newsroom in 1995, <laughs> where we put our two daily papers onto the web. Um, so it really gave me a, a foray into technology and uh, uh, probably deeper than I probably needed to go. Uh, but I was uh, getting really into networking and, uh, you know, kind of software do we buy and all of the things that you think of when you are running something and there's no recipe card. Yeah. So you, know, you go to these uh, trade shows and be trying to find out what something was. And of course, everybody said the same thing, right? It's like the best, the biggest, you got to have it. And I'm like, why? Why do you have to have any of this stuff? Right? So I think that has shaped my career when I finally moved out of away from media and decided to um, go full time into content marketing for high tech companies. But it's always in the back of my mind, like, why? Why are we doing this? And then how is it different than everybody else? And enough with the, the outward messaging stuff that you guys want to push out there. I want to I want to find out and unearth uh, what's really going on. So. Um, troublemaker might be part of my brand. I don't know, um, but but definitely that reporter um, is is still alive and kicking there. I love that because you know one of my first jobs um, out of college in that same time frame was taking our um, our alternative weekly and moving their online platform from a bulletin board system to their very first website, which we had a developer create from scratch and just going through all of that kind of build. And it's funny because then what am I doing now? Full circle. I am, you know, helping people replatform their websites and completely rewriting, you know, copy for their brand all the time. So it is funny. <laughs> well, you triggered you triggered something. Um, we I'm in New Jersey and the site that we created was called In Jersey. And uh, but we had a bulletin board site that was called In Joycey. And In Joycey <laughs> was really to try and get the, that cohort of people that were not involved with newspapers, the younger audiences, they were involved in the bulletin board system. Well, then we got hacked. And that threw me into the whole security realm. <laughs> <laughs> and we had the secret service at our door when somebody from in Joycey was threatening the president of the United wow. States. So, uh, yeah, it's been This like, is how you ended up doing tech content. This is exactly right. how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we just did oh, I know what that. that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, back to the tech content marketing and just content marketing in general. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what you feel are some of the key business benefits of commissioning primary research. Um, and let's maybe take it from a B2B and B2C standpoint, sure. because I know, you know, those audiences, while they can both benefit from the research, I think they use them a little differently. Yeah, it's true. The uh, they do and they don't. I mean, there's there's nuances, but but very little. Ah, uh, Max is saying hello. So hello, everyone. That's <laughs> Hi, Max. Max. <laughs> um, yeah. So for, uh, sorry, just it, he just threw me for a loop. Um, the advantages when when you're with with a high tech company, and and I've been typically with smaller brands. Um, brands that are looking to make a mark out there. And, and they say to me, because I would head up content and comps, they'd say, well, you know, let's have a PR firm and, and we'll have the PR firm say how great our product is. And I was like, that's not quite how it works. But if we want to try a different approach to working with 
and earning the media wanting to cover us, then let's go out there with some primary research where we know the industry. Not, and I want to make this distinction between product marketing research and and primary research that's about the industry. So, so one, you're trying to understand a little bit more about who your buyer is, uh, what uh, periodicals they might be reading. Um, we, you know, we call it the persona and we're looking at the persona. That's great. You have to do that. But, but primary research, industry research is different. It's looking at the industry as a whole and how does your product fit into that ecosystem? And if your product is truly new and innovative, it's going to ch create disruptions, right? And that's what the web is all about. This major disruption. How do these pieces fit in with the the daily workflows that the people are already experiencing how can it be different why should it be different so you really have to take this more uh, macro view of the universe and and try and get people to think outside the box now when you're presenting your messages you understand the industry flow a lot better um and then there's so many benefits from that as well it's not just the media is interested especially if you produce an industry report. Um, but your investors are interested because you're speaking differently to them. You're speaking in this broader sense of how you fit in. It's not just a whole bunch of adjectives that every other tech competitor is using. Um, your customers appreciate it. Your partners appreciate it. You know, the litany goes on and on. So I, I'm such a huge fan of primary research. Totally. To me, I think the biggest difference I see between how um, B2B companies and B2C companies use it is I think a B2B company is a lot more likely to create like um, a customer facing ebook or other pieces of content that are very directly like the research results and what it means for you and your business. Whereas on the B2C side, um, the proprietary research does still get used in things like advertising and social here and there. Like, oh, you know, you know, we know that like 98% of you said this thing and like it'll be used, but it seems like it's more likely to be trickled out more like one message by one message to, to that um, consumer audience versus on the B2B side. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that is the deficiency of B2B, that they're not thinking in a broader sense. That's one of the things that um, I started this company. My website is still underway, so it's the quotable leader. But the idea behind it is you all these companies want to have a thought leader, right? You want somebody within your staff that goes out there and can talk to the industry. What are they talking about? If they have nothing to talk about that's new, why should they be asked to speak at a conference? Why should they be quoted? Why should the media want to ask your company any questions? So this is supposed to be a platform that launches that, plus the lead generation, plus the statistics in your blog posts, the idea behind the fact that you have fact-based content, fact-based, fact-backed, facts-backed content. <laughs> Um, and, and you're using your own citations, right? Which is nice. It's like, it's great to give, you know, Erica did this survey, so I'm going to quote Erica. But if you do the survey, you actually have, you know, that, that uh, attribution for yourself. And it holds you up as a different level of authority, which I think is really important because there's another audience member out there, and that's Google. Google is looking for this experience and expertise and it's really hard to show that you're experienced and have expertise if you're not quoting yourself. Yeah. So um, that, that's that's yet another reason. But you are so <laughs> right. B2C's got it. They get it. Um, B2B is light years behind. So, you yeah. know, hopefully. And I wonder, there. Yeah. I wonder, too, if part of that is frequently, um, you know, if people are doing research in-house, which I feel like on the B2B side, it frequently is done in-house. Um, they'll kind of source from a bunch of different people. Like, what is the thing that you want to learn from, you know, our audience? You know, what is the question you have? And, you know, it, not necessarily starting from the point of having like a narrative or a point of view that they want to flesh out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about perspectives and having that perspective going into creating proprietary research versus, you know, as journalists, we're always taught, don't have an, a, you know, don't have an opinion, both sides, all that. And that's great. 
But literally, if you put together a piece of research that you don't have a perspective, you don't have an assumption to be proven or disproven, if you just have a bunch of questions together, it's going to be really hard to have any anything to say about it <laughs> at the end of the day. You are so correct. Um, I was very fortunate at the newspapers that uh, we put online, uh, the Ezra Park Press, the Home News and Tribune, uh, they were owned by New Jersey Press. And when they, they set up, um, we had a, a polling department and they, they issued polls, uh, political polls usually, and they were, you know, picked up and recognized by the national media, other, other media entities. Um, I worked in that office. I wasn't doing the polls, but I, this guy, I had a bird's eye view on how to get it done. And he emphasized not only the idea that you had to have this, you, you, you wanted to have a frame of reference, but you didn't want to lead. And I think that's, he was adamant about that. And it's, it's really, I, I think we see it a little bit now in consumer polls, especially political polling. They say, how can it be? How can this result be when there's this other narrative going on? It is very easy to ask a question in such a way that you're going to get the answer you want instead of the perhaps taking a, a true pulse of what's happening. When we would do our industry polls at, at these different companies that I've, I've worked with some really great surveyors and they keep you honest. They'll tell you, this is not a question. You're, 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 too, you're being too introspective here. You want to go broader. And, um, you know, so it was sort of a, a, a very collaborative effort and it's a bit of a dance. And of course, you have the product marketing team that wants to get their product marketing questions in there <laughs> and they're paying for it. So you got to get a couple of those in there, but you really want to broaden it as much as you can. The reason why is when you issue, we didn't do just an ebook, we actually issued reports reports that then would go out to the media that the media would then quote and you know i'm really proud of the amount of uh national and international pickup that we would get uh from these industry reports and i think it's because we took that extra time we would think of the headline that we wanted to get now it didn't always work let me give you an example <laughs> sumer report that we Been did there <laughs> We did a consumer report. We interviewed 4,000 people, um, consumers who shop, right? And work with computers because we were trying to get information about people who worked, the working uh, public as were well as shopping and what their feelings were on customer service and so on. And it was this shopping angle was just a nightmare. There was literally nothing new. We did it uh, year over year. And there was nothing there. There was nothing, nothing, nothing. So I got into the cross tabs and this guy, Gary Deckeldeck from years and years ago, who has sadly passed. Um, he always, he taught me about cross tabulations. Look at narrow the cohorts, start seeing if there's a pattern, an emerging pattern, uh, perhaps from a younger generation or from a different, a different demographic. That's where the story was. It wasn't what we originally went out with, but we could see this, this growing story. We saw two things. Generation X was coming into their own, boomers are retiring, Generation X is now taking the lead. What are the presumptions that Ge Generation X have? And I'll, I'll give you an example, user interfaces. We grew up with user, you got what you got. There was no fighting <laughs> about it. There was no arguing about it. If it's dumb, it's dumb, but that's what you have to do. You adjust your workflow to whatever dumbness is on this screen. Gen Z's not like that. Gen Z's been buying things in their sleep. They've invented TikTok. They're doing all this sort of stuff, right? Guess what? They don't want to work with your system. They're not going to work with your system. They're going to quietly quit or they're going to loudly quit. They're not going to put up with it. So you're going to see a change in behavior now when people with their internal systems are saying, hey, we got to change things up. We can't, we, this younger generation is not going to accept the same thing that, you know, perhaps we older ones endured. Totally. Uh, before we dive into talking about, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of what proprietary research entails, I did want to share this question from Todd Jones. 
um, which is, you know, what are some good types of research for B2B companies to do with, um, you know, the conversation that we've been having kind of in mind? Uh, well, we did a lot of uh, industry research. We would go out and um, we, if you're going to be quoted by the media, you want to have it statistically sound. That number changes. Um, if it's a cohort, a very narrow cohort, it's very hard to get a CIO. A hundred CIOs and you've got a really robust um, survey of a certain size company, et cetera. Okay. It, the more narrow you are, the less the number can be. If you're going out with a broader survey, you're looking at five, 600. If you're looking at consumer survey, you're in the thousands. So just to give yep. you some ideas, it's easier to get consumers than it is to get CIOs. And that's, and the media knows the distinction because they're trying to do research. So um, phone surveys, qualitative surveys where you're talking people to people, um, like what you're, you and I are doing right now, where we're, we're getting feedback from one another. One of us could be writing it down. Ethnography is really important when you're looking at uh, user interfaces. So this is where you're observing people. How are they with their workflow? What are they doing? Um, this is where you, you terms like swivel chair, you, you know, between working between screens and you start hearing things like, you know, uh, the swivel chair workflows and, and looking to unify those. Um, a lot of user experience people will look at uh, ethnography. Focus groups is another one, although I think they're few and far between compared to consumer. Um, and then just, you know, one-to-one -one interviews, small cohort. You can do online where you, we have a, a, a people watching us right now. If we were to put a poll in the chat and say, how many people are doing X, Y, Z, people give you an answer. It gives you a gist. It's not, it's not something scientific, but it gives us an idea. Um, plus, what we're, we're also talking to right now are people who are very interested in content marketing. So that's another thing too. How, what is their interest? And I'm probably a little bit all over the place in giving my answer, but uh, it 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 changes by subject matter, by the audience you're talking to, uh, but. But a lot of the, the research mechanisms that you might have learned in school or um, can do in consumer can also be done in um, uh, B2B, although, as you know, it's not. The people don't normally budget for focus groups and things like right. that the way that a consumer brand would. Totally. Um, and all I would add to this is, you know, one of my like longest running um, proprietary research projects that I was part of was we had a VC client that did um, a CFO index. Um, I'm sorry, a technology client through um, a VC partner we had who did a, you know, a CFO index every quarter and had kind of a mix of the questions that would stay the same so we could get that trending over time. And then they would take, you know, some of the questions or some of the things that they kind of saw bubbling up in media coverage for their industry, they'd add in some of those and they would get tremendous media pickup because they became this trusted source for this very specific data set that nobody else had. So I'd say, Todd, that's the other thing is that you can always ask when you have you know the opportunity to do media calls, ask them like, what is one stat you wish you had? And if it's in your power to add that kind of thing to your proprietary research, you, you know, you end up with a best friend. Um, when I was at Achievers, I had a reporter from Forbes, the actual old print magazine, not Forbes online contributor, um, an actual reporter from Forbes emailing me asking, you know, when is this year's research coming out? Because they counted on it. They knew that every year we did a very specific, you know, set of research um, that they were planning their editorial coverage for. So, you know, being dependable and having some of that kind of stuff that can be more than just a one-time thing, I think, is the other um, really good thing to do. I, I, I agree. Um, one of the things that I, I mentioned before that to be careful not to always frame the question in such a way that you're getting that very uh, introspective answer. Um, but that said, you also can do that. And it's it's a great opportunity. If you think you have something, a process, maybe a workflow, um, or just a hunch about the industry that you want to test, it's a great way to, to do so. So we were um, uh, at Coveo, we were asking the question, 
I had seen at a prior company, the search center of ex excellences, um, or I'm sorry, centers of excellence within uh, the high, within the IT group. And they, even though they're big sprawling enterprises, they, all these different people would be like a birds of a feather within an organization to be that center of excellence and be able to speak about things. So I asked the question, we asked the question, are you considering a search center of excellence? We really wanted to get the idea of one out there yep. to see if anybody would buy. I couldn't believe it. The answer was like 50% were either already implementing them. We were behind, but the whole industry was behind. Um, so it was like one of those really surprises. So that went out on the covers that, you know, and, and they, they cited other problems. They didn't feel like they were getting the ear of executives. And so we were we were coming up with, with ways. So while we presented the information in a straightforward, non-editorialized way, we also had tidbits or analysis where it was sort of our perspective, the Coveo perspective on this. So we could get that in there um, in addition to the other. So there's lots of, lots of fun things you can do with research. <laughs> totally agreed. Um, that said, you know, what does it actually entail to conduct primary research? Are you always doing audience surveying or what are some of the, you know, what are the things that it always needs to have so that people understand, you know, what they're kind of, um, what they're taking on if they decide, okay, we want to do proprietary research. Well, audience research is, is the best. I mean, the, I, the best from my perspective in that it gives you the most um, options, but we, are you, when you say what other type you can, you can, you could be taking somebody else's research and doing an analysis of it, but that's not really primary research. That's using second, right. secondary research where you're laying your layer, overlaying your analysis on top of somebody else's data. Um, I, and right now you want to own your own data, right? That, yeah. That's the king to everything. Um, but maybe I'm not understanding your question. So I want to make sure I, I answer it properly. Um, really, I think it's helping people understand the difference because there are people that will publish, you know, a report that is them, you know, aggregating like a bunch of, you know, U.S. Labor Department data and saying, hey, we spotted this trend that nobody's talked about. And while that's interesting, that's not proprietary research and you don't own it. And quite frankly, you may not even get credit for when people yeah. write about it because yeah. it wasn't your data. It's not your data. It's your analysis, but it's not your data. And that it, your analysis is also as a thought leader, right? So I wouldn't poo-poo it entirely. And if you don't have the budget to go out and do uh, proprietary, that would be a good fallback because it's getting your name out there and it's allowing you to go out there and uh, assert yourself. But if you could, I would try and if there's that data point, go out there and look at it and see if you can't commission uh, a survey on your own. Um, I like to use outsiders because they keep me honest. It's something that the, uh, you know, I use, I use, uh, research firms. I don't conduct them myself. What I do is help the client frame what they want to at the questions that they're going to ask. We work closely with PR firms to, to see again, your point, is this what the media is interested in? PR firms usually have a really good pulse on that as well. So, uh, we, we put, uh, you know, together uh, on a great package. But I also think you can and should be, if you're having a user conference and you have a thousand people there, this is a great opportunity to reach out and ask people. And all you have to do is say, be transparent. We asked 500 people at our user conference about this question, and this was the answer. Okay. So in, you, you, you have a lot of options at your disposal that don't in, entail you going out there and asking uh, massive, you know, get, paying massive amounts of money. Um, if you're attending a conference, you might be able to work a sponsorship with the uh, conference lead. Can I put out this survey at your conference? Is this something you'll allow me to do and, and have a questionnaire? Um, I saw you promoting a questionnaire on your site uh, today. Uh, yeah, because, so uh, you know, whenever there's a friend of content chat doing any kind of research, we always love to share it. And Jenny Magic had actually been on here talking about 
her um, book on change fatigue. And she's following it up with, you know, one of my favorite topics, which is about all of that, you know, extra work that would just get kind of shoehorned into uh, full-time roles when you were already full. And it's like, oh, just squeeze it in. <laughs> it's a great survey. And these are excellent questions. So people are listening, they should go over to Eric's site and uh, help her out. Um, but that's, that's a perfect example of, uh, of um, you know, these all the different mechanisms that are out there. Andy Crestadina, um, content marketer, probably people listening know him quite well, er, annually does this uh, the blogger survey. And when you're trying to justify internally why you need to do something, I would pull up Andy's stats and sort of say, benchmark us against what his findings are. And that always helped um, with internal. And I'm, I'm certain that primary research can also be positioned as you're helping your customers figure out these baselines and benchmarks. Yep. You know, this is what others are doing. Maybe we should be doing the same thing. You know, that that type of uh, argument can be made. Well, it can be easy when you have customers coming to you with a question that you can't answer that you are like, oh, that'd make a great research topic. Or, you know, you're having those questions by the media where they're like, do you have any data to back that up? And you're like, no, but you're jotting it down and, you know, thinking to yourself, when we get budget, we're going to pitch it. But do you have some other um, some other ideas or maybe even a regular kind of workflow or process that you go through to um, identify those really juicy, relevant topics for proprietary research? Hmm. Yeah, uh, your VC firms are another great source because they're always asking those questions, right? <laughs> and they've got it from that meta um, but they're, they're out there looking at the whole, the whole uh, universe and they're wondering, and they're asking the same question. Why should I invest in this company? How is it going to disrupt? And, and, and I think that's the key is to look at your industry from the outside in instead of from the inside out. And it makes it, it's a, it, it shifts your perspective and it allows you to think differently. If you are coming up with a new product, and it's going to be successful, something else is going to give. What is that something? And what would be the behaviors out there that would make people fatigued with it and make them want to, you're thinking of, you're building a case. And so you're asking the questions that are going to help build that case. The objections that you're, and I'm going to stick with the high tech universe, right? the sales engineers are getting, they get asked phenomenal questions. Find out what are the questions that they're being asked? What are the RFPs that are coming in? What are people looking for? And hijack them. Why? Why are they looking for this? Why do they think they're looking for this? And see if that isn't an interesting question, especially if your product doesn't do that. You know, that that's where it can help out with, with product research. You may have something within your product that while you're not doing that specifically, your approach may obviate the need for that, but you need to discuss it and you need to have that, you need to have that factoid that's going to help you present that to the industry at large. So once you have that idea and you're like, okay, we know this is our topic that we want to pursue, you know, what's the next step for commissioning research for folks who've never done it before? Yeah. Like, um, you need to have a, a, a good, if you're, again, if we're going to build a, a bigger research project where we're asking a statistically sound number of people, if we've decided you want media, you're going to need to have some a, a st statistical uh, basis for that. And I would look for um, research firms. I mean, they can call me and I'll give them some of the folks that we've worked with. Uh, there's some that are really excellent in the high tech industry. There's some consumer researchers. Uh, I've worked with some great firms over in the UK. My PR firm was at, at all these different companies was really good. I don't tend to like using um, a lot of media companies can also offer that service. The thing is, other media companies aren't necessarily going to want to cite their data. So I'm <laughs> a little bit careful. In, in doing something with a media company. It's not a bad way to approach it. It's usually fairly cost effective and you will create that, that those data points, 
but it's not likely that you'll be able to uh, get others to actually other media company, other media outlets to actually cite your your data because that's they're not such a good. It. That's such a good point because we all get pitched by those media companies that now have that you know, sponsored content arm. And they really, you know, they come out and they're like, oh, we can do all of this for you. But you're right. Then frequently nobody wants to cite the research, especially if any of it, if any of the components of it are hosted on their site, that becomes a no because they just can't get it past their um, editorial standards. Another thing you can do is do it in conjunction with a partner. Um, again, you, you got to do your research. <laughs> you got to do your research on research. Um, sometimes there are big companies, um, and I don't want to name any brands, but there are there are companies out there, research companies, back by academia, or a link to academia, seemingly. Who controls the questions? Do they or do you? Because if it's their brand, chances are they're going to want to do it their way. Look at those research reports. Is this something you want to go out with? Is it dense and scholastic and academic versus something that's more accessible? Does it meet with your brand tone? Yeah. So you want to do that research as well to see. And and if you do get- It's important to get their logo. Like is getting their logo on research that also has your logo, what's going to get your foot in the door for a sales call? And if that's the case, then even if you're not getting the data that you want back from it, it can be worthwhile. But it's, you know, you totally- exactly. yeah. It's all yeah. about what your objectives are. Yeah. So I think you have to look at it like a partnership and, uh, you know, whoever, whomever you're doing it with, it's it's got to be a partner who, and if that partner is in servitude to you because you're calling the shots, you actually, you know, you, you get to have, um, it's the most uh, flexible way. And I think yeah. you can leverage it the best. Um, when you start getting other people involved, it, you got to compromise. Uh, what is it you're compromising and it is okay. You know, if you're on the, the, the coattails of somebody else and you want to yeah. marry, like you said, marry your logo to them, that that's a great opportunity and yeah, you're defraying the cost to do so. Yeah. And I've been, you know, I've done it all the ways <laughs> and, you know, there are different reasons for choosing the different folks to partner with. Um, and, and the outcomes were different on every single one. So yeah, definitely um, you have to do your research and don't be afraid if you are considering working with a company, ask them to give you some examples of, you know, the publicly available, you know, outcomes from doing the research. Cause sure there is confidentiality and there's some things they can't share with you. But if it was something that was shared publicly by the company that they were contracted with, then they can share it with you and just see, is this, you know, is this going to work for us? And how, how willing are they to help you with the crosstabs? If you say to them, because they'll present the data mm -hmm. to you based on, you know, this is the results we got. But if you're seeing a pattern in there, and I, that was my favorite thing to do, right? That's the, that's the nerd in me. <laughs> I mean, they're going, but they, you know, like, I, they would be graciously, they would, they would go and, and, uh, you know, give me, give me new pie charts with this, yep. uh, uh, narrowed data. So, you know, see if people are willing to do that. I've also worked with companies where they didn't do the cross tabs. They didn't identify the demographics. You would think that that would be, I, I didn't know people didn't know that. I didn't do that I, as a, so now it's like one of the things I always make sure it's written in that you'll provide us uh, a cross tabulation against the demographic data and what other information we need to know. That's so important. hundred percent. We also and did I qualifying questions. Mm -hmm. um, we used, um, for example, when we were doing something on um, enterprise search, we used the Gartner definition of enterprise search because some of these terms are even murky, right? It's yeah. like, what's a CRM? <laughs> what's a CMS? <laughs> Everything's a CMS. But when you're talking about something specific or a certain size market, you might want to have that dictionary definition. Do you agree with this term? Is this something? And you can pre-qualify your respondents yeah. that way. And then you can maybe have an exit app. If they're not, you know, you would just either end the interview or maybe they fall into a different bucket and you can, you know, have a branch and ask them a few other questions. 
So I think those are some really common pitfalls, but are they, are there any other ones that people should really be thinking about when they're, you know, putting this plan into place for fielding and activating the research? Are there any other questions to make sure to ask? You're going to have less problem with your external people than you are with your internal people. <laughs> <laughs> You're have you been working over my shoulder? <laughs> 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 I hope no uh, CMOs are listening. Um, yeah, you know, th they think if they're paying, they're paying for something. You know, you don't go to the doctor and have all these diagnostics done to have to tell them what you want the results to be. You know, let let the researchers pull the data, start to see the story. If your your company is way amiss from that you know, this alignment with the industry, that's that's an issue. Um, I guess you could decide at that point whether you want to polish up your resume and ditch. But, you know, I, I think <laughs> most people are thinking in terms of what is the industry saying? How can we better position ourselves in this pool? So I think it's your job if you're commissioning or if you're running this project to be able to say to them, hey, we're gonna get an objective viewpoint. It might not be what we think. Are we gonna be okay with that? And that and, and start prepping them and you know for, for what these answers might be. And, and position it too, that it's an opportunity to either test a message or tack a message or whatever we need to do to, to get out there. I fortunately I haven't really seen that. I do think for startup companies with very limited budgets. Primary research might be a very great go-to-market strategy. Yep. Um, just do that industry, you know, bite the bullet, do it. You may not have even hired a CMO. Maybe you have a marketing uh, person on board. Uh, you're, you're hiring a fractional uh, content officer like yourself. And you're, you're, let's go out, get that uh, original research. We're going to be able to put out our industry report. We're going to be able to push it out to media. We're going to be able to show the VCs, hey, this is this is what we found. Um, this is how our message aligns, aligns with our findings. You're going to be able to do derivative blogs from it. You've got that ebook that you were talking about, the lead gen ebook. So you've got an entire program that you can now do for, you know, under six figures. And without any other senior management yet. So I think for very small companies that you're in the 20 to 30 range, early money, just starting to, this is a good time to do research. Start that project and, and do that year over year and, and own it, own that, that market that you're, you're trying to own. Totally. Um, in that vein, um, do you have any tips for how to make sure that you make the most of, you know, launching or announcing those research findings? Because I think especially in a younger company, if they don't have a CMO or um, an experienced content leader, the temptation can be there to just sort of publish the findings and maybe send out a press release and then wait for something to happen. And as we know, waiting for something to happen is a great way to um, grow gray hair. Yeah, I, I've got a, an agency that I work with and I can do a one-off uh, press release and pitch for, just for this purpose. So we've, we've bundled it in so that the whole thing is counted because you can write the press release. Um, the press release really should have the headline findings. Mm -hmm. And let me back up for a second. So what is news outlet looking for? They've got their audience. And if they don't have something to tell their audience, they're going to fail. It won't be relevant to their audience, yeah. right? So you fail in the eyes of their own. So you have to look at your your media readers, and that's who you're writing the headline for. And, yeah. and so you're looking to see, and it might mean multiple press releases. Nobody likes that idea, but I mean, but you might 100%. You might have to do it. And um, especially if there's different cohorts or there's different books you might be pushing into different. Uh, uh, verticals that you, and, and that's a great way, by the way. So not only did we do this enterprise search thing that was massive, but we then broke it down because we had the cohorts we went after. We did one for retail and we did one for financial services. The enterprise search one probably had the most anemic 
media because enterprise search doesn't really have its, it's not like a, you know, right. but for anything fintech, fintech, every all the fintech outlets loved it. All the retail outlets loved it. So we, we were able to get three industry reports, met three different press releases. We, and the PR team was pitching uh, the different editors, yeah. pitching them in different ways. And the proof was in the pudding when the, when we got the uh, the results back. You could see different media would pick up on different the different headlines. You know, it, it, everybody had a different way of saying what was important to their readership, and I I, I think that's one of the things we also made the industry reports fun. Um, when I say fun, they were they were colorful, they were accessible, they were things you could read quickly, almost like uh, imagine um, putting a a slide share together yeah. uh, of quick uh, power of, of quick uh, pie charts or bar charts or whatever, and an analysis. And then sometimes we'd have like our point of view on it as well. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of fun with it. Then we put that deck together and we gave it to our inside sales people as a sales enablement tool. Yeah. This was one of the ways we got more financing to do more of these things because the inside salespeople loved it. They used it as part of their emails out to folks and, you know, it could be a simple email with, did you know, blah, 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 blah. And then a small citation of who did the research underneath yeah. it. But um, yeah, so we had tons of ways to leverage these reports. And I, I really, really love that you make a point of understanding the different audiences that those media outlets that you're going to have your PR team pitch serve because too often, you know, you will see um, PR teams be like, well, we don't have time to do three different press releases. And I'm sorry, in this day and age, if you have three well-defined personas and you have a computer, which you do, you can have... AI help you version those, you know, that press release for the two other audiences you didn't write it for. And you can edit it and it'll take you just a few minutes. So yes, you do have time. And it makes so much of a difference because if you're speaking to the audience that the that the reporter that you're talking to serves, then they're gonna bite. But if you're speaking to a general boring audience and the pitch does not resonate with them immediately, you, they're not even gonna open that email. Yeah, it's, it's so true. It's so true. And I, it's, it's so, again, it's one of those things that it's hard for me to understand that people don't understand that all in, instinctively. But, um, <laughs> but you would be surprised. Yeah. Well, we have um, a question that I'm going to tee up um, that fits into the next thing I wanted to talk about was, was really about the biggest content opportunities to showcase your research findings. Um, and, you know, related to that, Todd was asking, about you know how you can work storytelling into the primary research. Um, so like how do you how do you tell a story versus just presenting that data? Like what are some of the content marketing opportunities to do that? If you're writing an industry report, it has to have a point a point of view. Uh, you're either going to um, you're either going to agree with what is already the conventional wisdom out there, but if it's going to be really really interesting. It goes against the grain because you're looking for a new point of view. So a new point of view might be like the story I was telling you before about the idea that you have this younger cohort that's coming up and they're not liking things the way they were. This is an opportunity. This is putting pressure on senior managers to do something different. It's both pressure and opportunity to now think in terms of the user interface and looking at employee satisfaction. Um, so maybe employee satisfaction becomes the, you know, the, the, the thread that's running through the narrative. But you are looking through that that through through uh, point, and and you hope to uh, be able to pull that narrative together. The uh, search center of excellence was our, the piece of information that came out that uh, search architects were frustrated that senior management executive at the C level didn't seem to understand. They wanted everything yesterday. They, you know, said how lousy the search was, hated everything, but yet nobody really showed any interest. There was nobody there that really wanted to. So by having the search center of excellence with a C-level sponsor, so we would give these little tidbits in there on how it could all gel and come together. 
And, and we asked the question, is the search center of excellence the answer to solving search, ex, you know, search architect frustration? You're showing the frustration, you're building the case as to why, and the data is there to tell the story. It's no different than how you storytell now and you're going out and looking at somebody else's data, right? Because at some point you're always getting a quote, you're getting a yeah. quote. If you're, otherwise, Gen AI has taken your job if you're not. <laughs> so, um, and that's another thing too, with Gen AI out there, this is a way that Google can ascertain that this is a human being touched this, you know, because you're pulling in these, these um, rich data points, but you're looking through that through line and and you're stitching it together now there may be a couple points that don't fit in explicitly but they're still interesting so you put them in there um nobody maybe you shove them in the back it doesn't really matter other findings it's the other findings yeah. part but there's a narrative and that narrative is usually on your front cover and that's what you're going out with to the press and you know you're looking for that angle and uh if you're I mean, as a reporter, that's what we would always do, right? We'd go out there and you'd be listening for something new and different to write about or else don't, nobody would pay you to, to exactly. go out write yesterday's news again. And, you know, Todd, you can also, you know, make sure to have at least one of those open-ended, you know, qualitative um, places where you ask people, is there anything else that you'd want to share on this topic? And you'll frequently get something really interesting there that you can quote anonymously but you can also even have a little box that you know, people can check that says you can uh, reach out to them to learn more about why they answered things the way that they did. And then when you're doing that cross tabulation and you find something interesting, then you look, OK, who said I can contact them? And you can do that follow up question. And then that becomes this really powerful quote that you can put into your research because then it it gives you some insight into why was that happening with that cohort you identified. I think one of the things that Andy does so well with his blog survey is that when he solicits us, he says, you know, if you participate, I'll send you the industry report. And I, I think that was that's really, you know, something terrific. Um, he was looking at people who were practitioners and he was he was interviewing practitioners. We were, you know, so you can do this bigger or smaller, but that's, that's one of the upsides of knowing who is participating is being able to solidify that relationship with the person as well, which I think is also another uh, great opportunity. So in your highly subjective opinion, having you know, been doing these kinds of things for I decades know. now, <laughs> you know, do you um, have some examples of some folks who do proprietary research that always have really solid content marketing um, that incorporates that research? Because I think it's always nice to give people some examples of where to go for inspiration. Yeah, dimensional research has been one of my go-tos for years. Um, Diane Hecklin is one of the founders. She's been doing this and she does it in the high tech industry. Um, she's uh, she does a super job. Um, she knows the market. Um, I mean, she knows high tech too, so she can actually help with with framing the questions um, and understanding. Hey, this this performed really well last year. I think we should do it again this year. Or you know what, we struggled with this last year. Let's like leave it. Let's not do a, a year over year comparison. So she's one of those people that I rely on um, to help me uh, pull together really good, uh, that that's on their, on their uh, high tech, going after high tech um, uh, IT people. On um, Arlington is a great company. They're out of the UK. They do a super job um, with numbers. They can pull together 2000 Americans, 2000 people from the UK. So we can get that cross tab going. Is there a distinction internationally um, and she can do all their international markets too. But Arlington is one that I've turned to. And she too does a super job of, um, I mean, because it's consumer and broader, she's not going to come in with as strong an opinion as Diane. But assuming you know your market, you should be able to do really, really fine. So that's just two examples right there. And then as far as like content outputs, you know, I always use... I mean, we always use Content Marketing Institute as such a great example of having um, really robust use in content marketing around all of the research that they do with marketing profs. 
Um, and I also always mention Salesforce and I have to, you know, disclaim, I actually was paid to do a lot of derivative content based on their research findings. And they are a machine when it comes to taking that research and the different audiences it pertains to slicing and dicing it and creating amazing content. Um, and they do that both for B2B and more kind of consumer data trends. And it was just really interesting to be part of um, part of all of that and see, you know, because they do very large scale research, right. which I think it's quoted everywhere. I get them quite a bit. Yeah. So um, before we wrap things up today, are there any other tips, pitfalls, or, you know, things for folks to keep in mind um, when doing proprietary research? Or do you have um, any kinds of um, frameworks or checklists of your own um, to share? Because we can link to them in the recap when we publish that too. I think one of the things when you're, when you're talking about, we didn't really touch upon qualitative research much, um, which is, it's hard but not impossible. Those are when you're doing these, these personal interviews. Um, but there's also other ways you can do qualitative research where you put ranges together and, and get people's feelings for things. You know, are you less likely, more likely? How do you feel? Um, I, I think that's really, and we always did four. Make people make a choice. Don't give them five, like, you know, where you're ambivalent. Make them, you're either very, sort of not very not sort of you know you're not you, you can't be ambivalent that's just you take that one out um so we always gave four choices and i think it's a it's a better way to know whether it's you know skews positive or negative now when you're writing it up you can move two of those together and and create your statistic that way so um yeah that's that's one of them and uh my, my the website uh the quotable leader will have uh a lot of examples up there. I'll, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll send you some information. I guess you, you put it up on your site. Fantastic. We'll look All forward right. to that. That's wonderful. So Diane, I know I'm going to see you next next week. Actually, this yeah, weekend. Please. This weekend at the um, CEX conference. But where else are some places where people can find you regularly? No, I'm, um, I'm actually pretty much at home at the Jersey Shore most of the time, <laughs> Erica. CEX is one of the few places where I go anymore. I was, uh, I traveled a lot. I see you, you on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. <laughs> LinkedIn, Instagram. I've got a Substack now, which is pulling in more and more of this stuff too. I'm Diane Burley at Substack.com. And I'm putting together a lot of this information on um, publishing as a media brand, being, a, being the media outlet. And, and a lot of the research will be there as well. So I thought you meant physically, where am I going? It could include that too. It depends on the person you're talking to. We got I was dance to class Jay, every I day. Talking to Jay Jay Bear. It was all the things. Come to my dance class. I'll be there tonight, <laughs> seven o'clock. <laughs> Love it. Well, Diane, thank you so much for uh, being our guest this me. week. And I hope that you've inspired more folks to think about how they can use proprietary research as part of their content marketing program. I hope so. And if they have any questions, reach out. It's fun, and, fun to engage <laughs> like this. And even though I'm going to be at CEX next week, I have a really fun and special CEX themed content chat for next Monday and for Tuesday. So stay tuned for those. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everyone. Bye now.